time I last. Seems like there have been a few little glitches with YouTube today. I apologize for that. Welcome again to another session of ASAP Online. My name is John Pollard. I serve as pastor at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Old Japan, New Jersey. Very grateful that you can be with this online version of a decades-long tradition here at Prince of Peace of studying the Word of God in a group called ASAP, named after a figure from the Hebrew Bible, but it is also the acronym Adult Study and Fellowship, ASAP, with a P-H at the end. So I thank you again for being here for our continued study of Paul's Corinthian correspondence, at least what has been known as First Corinthians, that is what we are studying here in these five weeks. So, shall we pray? Let us pray. A loving and gracious God, on this beautiful late spring day, we remember again the grace that you continue to offer to us daily. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your church for your living body of believers and all the many ways that you have abundantly gifted us with talents and skills and resources for conducting your ministry, for being empowered by love, the greatest gift of all, so that all people might know your presence. We thank you again for the witness of your servant, St. Paul, our brother in Christ, our brother in your name, and for the people that he served and witnessed to your power in the ancient city of Corinth. We ask now again for the presence of your Holy Spirit to stir up in us the gift of faith, open our ears, our eyes, our lives, and our minds, to receive your life-giving word, and to best discern how it is that we should use our gifts for serving you in this mission context, in this day, today. For all these things, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in your holy and life-giving name. Amen. Well, thank you again for being here today. It's a little bit warm in our upper room right now. We are having a little air conditioning problem, so maybe it's a good thing that the building is not able to be used by the masses right now. It is a little bit warm here upstairs. As any of you who know this room, know that without AC, it can get a bit heated. Good in the winter time with the sun shining in, keep the heating bills down, but it gets a little bit warm when the weather outside is also a bit warm. So thank you again for being here. A little review of what we covered to date in our first three sessions. You may remember way back on week number one that we were focusing on some of Paul's key theological perspectives. Um, and especially in the, in the Corinthian correspondence, we talked about God's presence in surprising places. Again, in the last place that we would expect to find God is, is often, surprise, surprise, where God shows up. The ultimate place being as, as a carpenter king hanging on a cross, or what Paul refers to as a crucified messiah. Sounds like an oxymoron would not have been what we would have expected from God if we were writing the story for ourselves, but yet God is in control. It's not about us, it's about God. And God shows his greatest revelation of love through the sacrifice on the cross. So we look for those places, those surprising, ordinary places where God continues to reveal his love to us through weakness, through suffering, through love, ultimately most of all. That's one of the key themes that Paul was preaching to the midst of a very conflicted congregation in Corinth. And then we talked about how in Corinth, everyone was kind of aligning with different people. Remember Apollo, I'm with Apollo, or I'm with Cephas, another name for Peter, or I'm with Paul, or I'm with Christ. I mean, again, as Paul says, can Christ be divided? Well, sin works to divide the body of Christ, but Christ, through his life-giving Holy Spirit, continues to work to stitch us together in love. And that's what Paul was getting at. It's not about groups and clubs. We are a church, 
a body of believers, we need each other. And he used those image images like body and feel to talk about growth and life and, and construction. All these things that are so very important for us, too, in our life as Christians. Indeed, one person can plant, another person can water, but it is God alone who gives the growth. And then in week number three, we talked last week about this, this freedom of the gospel. Remember that quote that Paul keep, kept raising up? All things are lawful, but not all things are useful. All things are lawful, but not all things are going to be beneficial. So Paul was pushing Christians in Corinth, both then and now, to think about and pray about, to discern what is going to be the most life-giving thing to do in any given set of circumstances, what is going to be the most loving thing to do in any given set of circumstances. Make our reverent best guesses, knowing that even if we are wrong, we are still blessed and forgiven by God, who works with us to help us to pick up any broken pieces that may have happened and to try better in the future. Keep at it. Perseverance, faithfulness. Again, that word from the Hebrew, chesed, steadfast love and faithfulness. That is what God models. That is what we are called to, to duplicate, to imitate in the way we live our lives in our love for our neighbor. So as we get into today's theory, or today's theme, I should say, about spiritual gifts and, and the body of Christ, body of Christ, again, picking up on a theme that we had talked about in an in earlier session, I have a reflection question for us to consider. What part of the church do we feel most like? If the church is compared to a body, human body, what would be the part that we, each of us, individually, would play? Just think about that. Pray about that. That's a good, a good topic for prayer. Oh, Lord, what part in your body have you made me? And how can I be the best me that I possibly can be for your glory? So, Let's get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Got my Bible down here. I read from the NRSV translation of the Bible. So if you are following at home, now would be the time to pull out your Bible and follow along. We're going to read the first 11 verses, if you will, from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. And then we're going to pick those verses apart a bit using some of these techniques that we have talked about in, in our Lutheran Book of Faith movement. Remember, historical critical methodology to get at the, the meaning of the text or, or the literary part. How is the text con, uh, constructed and written? And, and how does that affect our understanding of the text? Our, our, our Lutheran lens, if you will. Again, Lutherans have a particular way for studying the Bible. We see things a little bit differently than other Christian traditions, and that's a good thing. It is part of our saltiness, the way that we are salt and light for the body of Christ. So we'll use those techniques for looking at Scripture. And then finally, there may be some opportunities for, for devotion. How is it that we, in our own personal walk of faith, are enriched by the Holy Spirit, by the words that are being provided. So let's dig in. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 1. And I'm going to read until verse 11. Paul writes, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed. And let us stray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. Mm. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, 
There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but it is the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, and to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one in the same spirit who allots to each individually, just as the spirit chooses. Okay, let's pause now and reflect on these first 11 verses and, and what's going on here in, in Corinth. Again, Historically, we, we talked about in the first session that, that Corinth is a rich community. I mean, materially, they were very wealthy. We talked about its strategic uh, location, you know, in real estate, location, location, location. It is, it is there uh, on the Adriatic and Aegean Sea, on the Isthmus. They tried to build a canal even through uh, close to Corinth. They didn't quite get it done until the uh, 19th century, although they started it in antiquity. Um, so it shows that they have all this material wealth, but in addition to the material wealth, this is a place that has great spiritual wealth. Paul can see that the Holy Spirit is really alive and moving and has really blessed and gifted these, these believers in Jesus Christ in Corinth with some really marvelous tools for, for conducting ministry. And, and Paul's trying to wade through all of this, and he's acknowledging all of this here. And first of all, he's, he's getting at the point that the, the community needs to know that if it were not for the power of the Holy Spirit, none of their gifts would be possible. I mean, and he, he says it here, no one can say that Jesus is cursed if, if they have the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's one of the ways that you're going to discern gifts. If someone is saying that Jesus is cursed, then, they, then the Holy Spirit is not working in their lives. And, and that was one of the criticisms of, of many of, of hearing this news about a crucified Messiah because they would, they would look to some of the teachings from the past and they would say, aha, look at this. In, in past writings from our tradition, it says that cursed is the one who hangs on the tree. So you can't have a crucified Messiah. Well, Paul was saying, we do have a crucified Messiah. And yes, it says, cursed is the one who hangs on the tree. But that is the way that God has taken on the curse of sin for our benefit, so that we might be relieved and receive his forgiveness, grace, and mercy. It's this, this wonderful, joyous exchange again, where all of, our, all of our trash from sin, Jesus takes on himself, and, and we get all the benefits of his blessedness in all eternity. Joyous exchange that happens to us personally in the waters and promises of holy baptism. And that is the spirit, the Holy Spirit continuing to work on us. So if someone is stuck in a rut and saying, Jesus cannot be the Messiah because he hung on the tree and cursed is the one that hung on the tree, there you know then that the Holy Spirit is not present. But if someone is able to get beyond that and say that Jesus is Lord, you know that the Holy Spirit is effective and at work in that person's life. Praise be to God for that. And in fact, in the small catechism in our Lutheran tradition, getting into our Lutheran lens and devotional practices a little bit, what is it that Luther says when explaining the third article of the Creed? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. He starts the explanation to that third article by saying, I believe that I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, nor come to him, except that the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me in the one true 
and common fee. So, so again, Luther picks up on Paul's words in his explanation of the small catechism or the third article of the Apostles' Creed in the small catechism, saying and pointing to the importance of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was really working over time in Corinth, but continuing to work in wonderful and marvelous, mysterious ways in, in the church today as well. So, so we're getting at this issue of pneumatics, or pneumatica is, is the Greek word. Remember, we've talked about some of these Greek words, pneuma, which, which is a root for pneumonia, which is something that none of us want to have. It, it deals with the breath. The, uh, the, the pneuma is spirit or breath in Greek. So pneumatics would be uh, roughly translated into English would be spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts. That's what Paul is getting at here. They are all connected to the Holy Spirit. And, and there are basically, um, basically three different categories of spiritual gifts that are listed by, by Paul in this in this uh, passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Three categories of gifts that would be classified either as individual gifts, referred to in the Greek as the charisma. Charisma, you say that someone has charisma. Well, that's kind of what we're getting at when, when we're dealing with this, this series of gifts. The charisma, individual gifts, they are, they are really kind of attractive to others. Diakonia gifts. Diakonia translated into English would be service-oriented gifts. And then finally, the energomata, the energomata or the energized gifts, the gifts that, that actually inspire those activities that help to get, get the congregation fired up uh, and, and energized for mission and ministry. These are the gifts that the Spirit gives and for what purpose? For building up the body, or in Paul's words, working for the common good. That is why the Spirit gives these gifts, not so that I can say, ah, look at me, I've got all these wonderful gifts. It's not about bragging or being boastful about the experience that you've had. It's more about saying, look what love through the Holy Spirit has done to me for the benefit of all. We are gifted so that we might be a gift to others. Or in the words from Genesis, when God was speaking to Abraham, he was blessed to be a blessing to others. So Paul is, is deeply rooted in, in the Hebrew tradition and trying to build on these themes as he is trying to manage a, a wonderfully gifted but also terribly unruly and conflicted congregation in Corinth. Again, it was not boring in Corinth. I can guarantee you that. Paul was not bored when it came to trying to deal with the Christians in this ancient Greek city-state. So what are those gifts that Paul notes here? Wisdom, knowledge, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. These are the gifts that Paul has noted. And, and we can divide those into those three categories that I talked about, the personal, spiritual, charismatic gifts, the, the service-oriented gifts, or the energizing gifts, the inspiring gifts to get the people fired up. Um, and, and there might be, you know, you might kind of be like, is that a is that a wisdom gift, or, is, or should I say, is that a, a charisma gift, or is that an energizing gift? It, it, it might cross over at times. But certainly when it comes to wisdom, we're reminded again of what Paul says about earthly wisdom, that the Lord thwarts earthly wisdom, and that the true wisdom is a wisdom of the cross. In, in many ways, it's, it's again allowing ourselves to be open and to, to a way of unknowing. Got to be able to kind of, as Jesus says, uh, new wine for new wineskins, that we, we need to be open to learning something new. And sometimes it doesn't directly fall that what we've learned in the past builds on what we're learning right now. So, again, trying to stay open to a, a new lesson altogether. And that was certainly what 
Paul was trying to say by preaching a crucified Messiah. So when it comes to wisdom, yes, earthly wisdom has its place, but there is also this deeper wisdom of the cross that is, that is only really taught by the power of the Holy Spirit. Knowledge, well, knowledge is good too. If you want to be in, I mean, we all want to be in the know. Uh, certainly in, in ancient Greece, they, they were always looking for some new bit of knowledge or, or wisdom. That's how Paul got the attention of the Athenians. Uh, when he started talking to them about the unknown God at the Areopagus. And, and, the, and the Corinthians, I don't think, were any different there. So they recognized that knowledge is, is, um, is a real gift. And certainly in this day and age, too, we live in the information age. But not all the information we get is accurate or truthful, right? <laughs> Can we all say fake news? So it's important that knowledge be truthful and that it be used for good purposes. Again, what does Paul say? Is it being used for the common good to build up a healthy body of believers? Healing, I mean, what would we do without our health? Our health of body, mind, and soul. That is one of those gifts of healing, and certainly we are really in debt to those that are on the front lines of this coronavirus in this day and age who are practicing their healing gifts in order to help those who are ill, those that are indeed in need of assistance, doctors and nurses and medical technicians, EMTs, all those who carry on this healing work in our day and age. Paul says another gift is miracles. Ooh, do we still have miracles today? I would say so. I haven't seen anyone park the Hudson River, um, but but um, I, I I still think there are these miracles, even the, the basic miracles of faith, hope, and love. I mean, those if in in very difficult circumstances, if we're able to raise up these gifts, that's that's a miracle. We have some of, of the gifts of of how it is that we are able to believe in the miracle that in the bread and the wine of Holy Communion, we have the creator of the universe taking our human form. This is one of these traditions uh, of the early church, one of the two sacraments that we celebrate within the Lutheran tradition that Paul also had passed down to him from the early followers of Jesus. He wasn't there that night before Jesus died when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. But in this receiving of the bread and the wine, we had a miracle of faith going on. The very body and blood of our Lord, the creator of the universe, being able to compress himself into elements of bread and wine, all for our benefit, for feeding our faith. That, folks, is truly a current day miracle that goes on in our own day as well. So we say yes, indeed, to miracles, not just then, but today also. And how about this gift of prophecy? Do you remember what the role of the prophet is or was back then? It's still the same today. A prophet is someone who proclaims the word of God for the purpose of comforting the afflicted and for afflicting the comfortable. This word ministry is still as important today as it was back then. We need, again, prophetic figures who will stand up and speak truth to power, speak the truth in love where it needs to be spoken in times like these, where there's all kinds of conflict in the world. What is the prophetic word that the Lord says to us today? Prophecy indeed continues. Then we have the discernment of spirits. How do we know if it's a, a, a good spirit or an evil spirit? Sometimes it's difficult to know. Jesus would say that you know a tree by its fruit. Um, so are we able to recognize fruits as easily as we should? Are we able to recognize whether the energy, the charisma of a particular person or leader is one that is doing the work of the Lord to build up the body, or is it a spirit of division and of 
of destruction. We need those that can really discern and say, I don't see the work of the Spirit in this instance. Be careful. Be careful. As well as saying, have you thought of this person? Have you seen what this person is doing and what this activity is about? I sense the work of God's Holy Spirit over here. Are there ways that we can support this activity in our lives? Tongues. Mm. In Greek, tongues would be referred to as glossolalia. I believe that I'm pronouncing it correctly. Cor correctly, Forgive me if I am wrong. Um, speaking in tongues was a gift that, that the uh, Christians in Corinth were all goo goo gaga about. They really thought that this was was the cat's meow. If you had the gift of tongues, you knew for sure that the Holy Spirit was at work in your life. There was a visible sign of God's work in your life. And, and Paul was really cautioning on this gift of tongues. Paul was basically saying, hold on, time out. Yes, glossolalia, the gift of speaking in tongues, is a powerful and wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God for giving that to people. But, but just because you don't speak in tongues doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't working in your life. They were saying, I can speak in tongues. You can't speak in tongues? Well, I guess that maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit working in your life. Paul was really concerned about that type of an attitude. Paul himself, he, he spoke in tongues, but, but he would say later on in his Corinthian correspondence, after he talks about love in chapter 13 and then getting into chapter 14 a bit, he talks about how, how speaking in tongues is, is a gift, wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, but it's, it's probably the, the least important because he, didn't, he was concerned that it wasn't building up the body of Christ. Everything was about building up the body of Christ for him. If you have someone that can interpret tongues, if you have a bunch of people in worship and they're all caught up in the spirit and they're praying in tongues and it just it just sounds like a lot of noise, don't have someone that has the gift to hear and understand what is being said in a tongue so that everyone can understand. Paul then was concerned. He was he was questioning how effective the gift could be used for, again, the purpose of building up the body of Christ, building up the body of believers. Now, in our own day and age, there are certain groups within the church and in Christianity that continue to really celebrate and, and use the gift of tongues in, in worship and in their own personal devotions. It is truly a wonderful, meaningful gift of the Holy Spirit that is, is very powerful. But, but again, the question becomes how to use the gift if you happen to have that gift for building up the body of believers. If it makes you more bold in proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, that's a good use of the gift of tongues. I'll tell you that right now. Anywho, that, that completes the list of, of the gifts. And, and I would say that, you know, all these gifts are still present in the church today. And, and, and many more gifts than just this. This wasn't an, an exhaustive list that Paul has created here, but it is, again, another example of how what was going on in the ancient church still has application to what is going on in the church today. So, let's see. I think we're ready to move on now to the, to the next series of verses in chapter 12. So if, again, if you're following along at home, I'd like to invite you to please take a look now at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to pick it up at verse, at verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and we're going to complete the reading to verse 31. So Paul continues here. For just as the body is one and has many members and all of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, 
And we were all made to drink of one spirit. So again, Paul is emphasizing the importance of unity here. One spirit, one body. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many members. So now he's getting into the pluralistic nature of the body. One body with many members. If the foot would say, because I'm not hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And then if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a big part of the body either. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were here, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single, single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with the greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. One member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. And I will show you still a more excellent way. Here is the reading. And what comes next? What comes next? That's the great love chapter, right? By speaking the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. The great love chapter comes right after this. But getting into these verses here, starting at verse 12, um, with the various parts of the body. This Paul, again, is not, is not um, coming up with an original concept when he talks of the body of believers or that the church is a body. He's not, that's not original. Apparently, in the Greco-Roman world, um, many times people would talk about um, uh, the body as a symbol for a society at harmony. That's, that's what the rhetoric was, that they were trying in, in the Greco-Roman um, way of, of keeping order to see their country as a body, as a living entity. But in that instance, the rulers, they all represented the higher parts. And, and those persons who were of a, a lower social rank they were also then considered to be a lower part of the body. Um, the rulers were like in the head area, which was not covered up. Everyone could see the head, the eyes, the ears, and so on and so forth, the mouth, um, where, where the common people would maybe be the, the feet that were, that were covered up and, and not seen. And it was, it was all kind of a, a ploy rhetorically to, to keep the, the ruling classes separated apart from the common people. So now Paul is taking an image of a body and, and he's, he's, he's turning it around. He's reversing it. He's saying just the opposite, that, that the weaker parts, the ones that you would normally cover up, those are to be revered. 
The humble parts are to get more of the honor. How do you think, how do you think the people at Corinth would have responded to that? Hmm. Paul is shaking things up a little bit. Why though? Again, the mind of Christ, this, this, this humble servant leader that Christ was. So, so Paul is trying to push those that have supposedly the greater authority and ability to be more concerned for the needs of, of the weaker neighbor, to, to help the neighbor. Um, because maybe the weaker neighbor has the greatest potential for growth, but as this stronger member is, is sharing and learning to share, there is that great possibility for growth in them. Again, what Paul is doing is he's, he's stitching together the believers and emphasizing again that everyone is individually gifted, but everyone needs each other. That in, in, I talked about this in the preaching on Sunday, quoting from Mother Teresa of Calcutta, that, that we belong to one another. That is the way that Christ has made us. So Paul is emphasizing this point as he thinks about what church should be. And again, it's also this theology of the cross. You wouldn't, wouldn't think that the most emphasis would be placed on, on those with, with the, the more limited gifts, but, but that's what Paul says. Again, focus on each other. I remember it when I was in band, for example, um, my band director used to say that we are only as good as our as our weakest link. And, and he was trying to encourage everyone to grow in that way, that if one person were, were not practicing at home and, and they, they went right when the rest of the band was going left, <laughs> they'd kind of stand out, and, and that would be a, a check mark against the band's performance at a particular cavalcade. Perhaps that's also what Paul is getting at here, that, that we are... As body believers, we are an ensemble working together to create beautiful music that we are called to listen to one another and to harmonize, to bring out the best in one another. That is one of the real powerful gifts of, of community and this understanding of, of believers as a living, breathing entity or body. I want to look at two passages now from from scripture and other places to, to continue to build on, on this idea. I'm going to turn right now to one of the books from the Hebrew Bible, from the Torah. The Torah, you may remember the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those represent the Torah. This is going to be from Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 to 34. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 to 34, if you're following along at home, and I read here right now, this is, this is again when we think about our Lutheran lens, scripture interprets scripture, so we're looking to other parts of scripture to help us understand what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So here, Moses writes, these are the five books of Moses, the alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So again, you wouldn't think that an alien should have the same respect in place as a citizen. But surprise, surprise, the Lord through Moses is saying, this is the way it should be. You are to look out for those that are on the margins and, and treat them with, with great honor and respect. And then another verse, I'm going to move us to the New Testament again. It's Matthew chapter 20, and I'm going to read Matthew chapter 20, verses 24 to 28. Matthew chapter 20, verses 24 to 28. Here we go. This is that story about James and John, uh, the sons of Zebedee, and they were they were trying to cut a deal with Jesus about 
sitting at the left and the right hand of, of Jesus when he came into his kingdom. Well, Jesus wasn't real crazy about that idea, obviously, but um, he used it as a, as a teaching moment. And this is what he said then to James and John and the rest of the disciples. When the ten heard about what James and John had done, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So, so here, too, again, in the words of Jesus, we, we have this model again for the importance of service. And, and, and this idea, again, crucified Messiah is an oxymoron. Well, in many ways, servant's leader is an oxymoron as well. This wisdom of the cross, unexpected. This is not how the, how the, uh, the Greeks and Romans conducted business, as Jesus is pointing out, as Paul is pointing out. But if you're going to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, then you're going to look to serve. You're going to look to be humble. You're going to look to share love in word and deed wherever you can. Again, it's not about me. It's about God is what Paul would, would say. So the weak are honored. Service is celebrated. And it is all for building up the body of Christ. It's about bringing balance harmony, peace, health, looking for these things also in the body of Christ, in, in the church, back in Corinth, but also in our day and age as well. So then the question becomes, what is my role? Again, my, my question that I had for our consideration, if, as, as body of Christ, what is what are we doing in the body of Christ? What is the organ that we are in the body of Christ? What has God made us individually for the good of the whole? And how well are we performing our role? Yeah, think about it. Even more importantly, pray about it. Pray for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, for direction and discernment. So next week, we are going to be covering 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That'll be our final uh, session on Paul's 1 Corinthian correspondence. So if you are looking ahead, please try to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, another very important book or, or chapter in, in this inspired correspondence that Paul not just had with ancient Christians, it's, it's a way that he is continuing to correspond with us current day Christians as well. So would you please join me now in closing our session today with words that Jesus himself taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So dear sisters and brothers in Christ, friends in faith, I'd like to thank you again for joining me for this fourth session of ASAP Online. Please be safe, stay well. God's peace be with you now and always. Forward to seeing you next week. Peace.